Bonjour. We're back to continue the discussion of exegesis, the exegetical method, the bedrock of civil law interpretation, as I like to call it, so central and so essential it is. Uh, this video is split in two parts to avoid having it too long. So, as we've seen in the first video, exegesis is the search for legislative intent. Uh, when the text needs interpretation, and interpretation may be needed because of obscurity of language, because of the generality of terms, and we know that there are many general words out there, or the silence of the text, you look for legislative intent. And here are now the tools that you're going to look at. You'll first consider legislative history. You will then look into doctrinal and judicial interpretation. Logical processes are largely used, and they will be discussed in the detail, as will also a few maxims of interpretation that are guiding the work of the interpreter. A little caveat, you're not using these methods in sequence or use one and not the other. Most of the time when you have to do the interpretation of a civil code article or any other legislative provision, you tend to combine these various approaches and build your interpretation. Or if you are reading a judgment, you try to second guess and understand what is the method of interpretation that has been used by the judge and you may find indication in the judgment of the usage of this or that element of the interpretative method. Let us start with legislative history. You will, of course, especially if the law is recent, look into preparatory works or travaux préparatoires, as we call them in French. At the time when the civil code was adopted, all the preparatory work had been compiled into several volumes known under the name of the editor, Fernet. So if you want to understand where provisions from the civil code, the French civil code are coming from, or the Louisiana civil code, when it borrowed from the French, you would go to Fernet. For more recent statutes, you may look at what we call in French the exposé des motifs, which is a series of statements explaining why that piece of legislation has been adopted. You may look into parliamentary reports that are published or made public, and you may even want to look at the parliamentary debates though you have to be cautious when you read that these documents because they are very often moved by political ideas rather than legal doctrines. So all this material is there. I mean, it helps you figure out why legislation was adopted, but you've got to use them with caution, right? And double check using, of course, the other methods. Uh, Oftentimes, especially when you go try to make sense of provisions of an old code, you may go to historical sources, ancient sources that may go as way back as to Roman law, and of course, modern sources when there has been evolution. Anything that you can get about the historical background informs the context on which your interpretation is going based. Uh, doctrinal sources can be very significant. You may want to look into what scholars said before the legislative intervention, pointing to deficiencies in the law and understanding the previous defects will help you understand the remedy 
that has been approached. Uh, like, you know, when you want to understand why you are prescribed one type of medicine, you like to look at what you've been diagnosed with, okay? So doctrinal sources have also their significance regarding the, I mean, are part of the historical material. Sometimes, or oftentimes when you are in Louisiana, you may want to consider some foreign sources uh, whenever you know that they have had some influence. It's rarely the case in the context of France, though in civil procedure, France is following the lead of Germany. And uh, Louisiana, of course, we often go to uh, French sources, especially if they have been translated into English, uh, like the famous uh, treatise by uh, Planiol, uh, which was uh, made available in the English language. The second set of methods is doctrinal and jurisprudential interpretation. I will not further elaborate on this because this has been discussed in the previous module. So go to the material regarding module five to understand how doctrine and jurisprudence may impact the way uh, we look at a statutory provision. That fully makes sense because you would expect courts in your present case to be informed by earlier jurisprudence and more likely than not, especially if you have jurisprudence constante, they will follow uh, such a jurisprudence. I come now to logical processes, logic and the law. And those have a very significant role in the exegetical approach. Because after all, logic is, should be the friend of the lawyer. Okay, these logical processes are a way to bring in the spirit of the law whenever you are struggling making sense of the letter. Okay, a logical process is typically an argument that is based on the spirit of the law or reflects such spirit uh, of the law. Now, what is it that we call the spirit of the law? It's a nice uh, term. It echoes, of course, the book by Montesquieu. Uh, well, okay, you can see it in different way. And I'm going to use the photographic uh, lenses there. If you zoom in on the provision that you have to interpret, it is the reason behind the legislative text or behind the legislative provision that you are struggling with. You try to identify the reason behind that legislative provision. We call this in the legal, uh, the civil law tradition, the ratio legis, okay, the reason behind the lex, the legislative text. But if you zoom out, and sometimes you need to zoom out to have the big picture, it can be the broader reason that is behind the entire legal systems. Uh, the reason behind the law, the ratio juris, okay? The reason behind the law at large. And that may reflect common good, uh, general interest, of the child whenever you are dealing uh, with the uh, legal provisions uh, relating to children, protection of a weaker party if your legal system cares about protecting people who are in a weaker uh, position. And remember, we addressed already the ratio juris or the ratio legis when we discuss gaps and lacunae, because you try to fill the gap or the lacuna trying to second guess what legislators would have done, ratio legis, or get your judgment inspired by the deep reasons that underlie the legal system at large. So it's very important that just like the good photographer, we zoom in, we zoom out. Don't forget what I said about the breathing exercise, okay? There is dynamism in the way you approach the law and develop your thinking about it. Don't think that everything is static. Don't think it's number one, number two, number three, number four. Very often you have to go back and forth, move 
backwards, forwards, uh, to build your make your uh, final argument. It's messy at times, but you've got to accept that the mess is part of life. But all these processes that we're going to study will help you structure your thinking and make it less messy, as it were. Uh, I like to insist on the importance of common sense, experience that is informing your judgment or your thinking about legal problems and interpretation. The more experience you develop, the better you're good at it. And common sense is never to be ignored in legal matters. Uh, don't forget that exegesis comes from this very old Indo-European root to have flair. Get a sense in the proper name of the word sense of, you know, of all this is going. Uh, saying this, don't forget my warning on the previous slideshow, never neglect the text and the anal analysis of the text itself, okay? All this needs to go and be combined. Okay, now I have a sort of scary catalog of logical uh, processes. Uh, apart from hocus pocus, you have them all there, all these Latin words. And uh, we're going in a way to try to map out uh, the brain of the good exeget, you know, hence the visual that you have. So take a deep breath and we're going through this argument one after the other, of course, with examples as we move on. Let us start with an argument called ab absurdum. Uh, any interpretation that would lead to an absurd result must be resisted. Why we do resist absurdity? Well, we presume, or at least we hope, that legislation is an act of reason. We know there are political factors out there. We know that all legislative provision is not reasonable, but we at least presume that they try to do a sensible job and we should resist any uh, temptation to go to absurdity. Now, that makes it look obvious, but you know, sometimes when people do not like a law, they may want to apply it in a way, yeah, no, no, I say it, it was stupid to adopt that law. You yeah, look, I've got to apply it now and see what the outcome is. Even if you don't like that piece of legislation, you've got to try to apply it reasonably if you are a judge. And of course, if you are arguing the case for one of the parties, then it may be tempting to play a little bit with it, okay? But judges will try to resist absurdity, or at least they should. An example that we have seen uh, uh, in the previous uh, module, an old provision in the Louisiana Revised Statutes was actually uh, creating an obligation on drivers of motor vehicles to blow the horn whenever you would pass another vehicle, which makes sense at the time when the law had been adopted, but doesn't make sense anymore on multi-lane freeways, especially when they are in urban or suburban areas. So one should resist uh, the idea, say, I've got to impose and fine a driver who has not blowing, bl blown the horn or find that driver liable because not blowing the horn when driving on the I-10 on a section where you have four lane in every direction, that would be stupid. Okay, this is to be resisted. Another argument uh, based on logic is the capacity that our minds have to make analogy, okay? Um, and that's the argument at Perry Ratione. Uh, you have, which means for the same reason, parity means identity. So you've got a text or provision that covers a given situation and a sort of similar situation, but which is not directly provided for occurs. Can you extend by analogy the application of the existing provision? Okay, you may do it, and it's perfectly okay under exegesis to extend the scope of a provision 
but you must have a good reason to do it. You must do it in a logical manner, okay? If you see that the reason behind the law would be the same for applying the law to the anticipated situation and the unanticipated, then go ahead and make an analogy. Then you are on safe grounds. The example here is not taken from the civil code, but imagine that you see no dogs on the train, okay, on a rail platform before you are boarding the train. And you are traveling with a cat and you wonder, may I board the train with a cat or a rabbit? Or some people may want to travel with chicken. Why not? I mean, uh, if the chicken is dead, you know, in a cooler, etc., it would be a different story, okay? No dogs. And again, you know, that's the interpretation. We suppose that it's a living dog, but who would travel with a corpse with, uh, of a dead dog? So, uh, can you apply? You've got to find the reason, okay? Why do they ban dogs on the train? Okay, if you want to avoid a nuisance uh, for other passengers because of noise or the movement of the dog, though on a leech or etc. Maybe the same with the cat, but the cat may be in a kennel and be you know, no nuisance unless it is meowing, you know, all the... Uh, all the way, okay? So you've got to try to identify what is the reason behind this. Do they want to exclude all pets? And uh, yeah, your pet may be a chicken, uh, or is it only dogs, okay? So you have whom, in that case, if you can make a convincing argument that the reason is indeed to prevent other, you know, fellow passengers from the noise, the smell, or any uh, nuisance that can be generated by a pet, you will enlarge to cats or rabbits. So to do this, you have to do deep thinking and find the reason behind the law, okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, and you may also say, and that would be typic a typical common law argument, oh, no dogs on the train, I have only one dog. So that's okay if my dog is in the singular. Ah, uh, yeah, but you have this provision saying, you know, that the plural includes the singular or etc. For we civilians, it's a no-brainer. If they say no dogs on the train, it will be singular or plural. Um, now, an example of an analogy that you would find in the civil code itself. Um, up going to take this in the um, law of sale, okay? The sale is a contract by which one person transfers ownership of a thing to another for a price in money, okay? You pay money in exchange of a thing. And the code is also dealing with a contract of exchange, which is a contract by which one person transfers ownership of a thing in return for another thing. You don't receive money, but another thing in exchange. It's just like a, a barter. So does the law of sale apply to exchanges? Because when you look at the code, you have many more provisions for the contract of sale than you have in Title VIII about exchange. Sale is Title VII, exchange is Title VIII in Louisiana. But look, Sometimes the code is giving you the answer. Uh, Louisiana Civil Code Article 2664 says, the contract of exchange is governed by the rules of the contract of sale with the differences provided in this title. So it is inviting you in applying by analogy everything you find in Title Seven about sale, except for those few rules that you will find in Title VIII that actually make an exception to the sales rules. Another argument, which is also analogy, but slightly uh, different, is the argument at fortiori. A fortiori, you have the word force, you know. The uh, reason to make the analogy may actually be more forceful than we have seen previously. We are dealing here with cases where the reason behind the law is even stronger. 
And okay, the text says no dogs on the train. What about tigers? Can I board the train with a tiger, with my the tiger? Ah, oh, you know, the hell no, because if it is to avoid disturbance of other passengers, the disturbance or the, even the danger that the pet may cause to other passengers is greater in the case of a tiger or a lion, since I'm originally from the city of Lyon, which means lion. Uh, think of another example. Uh, imagine that the law says that people under 21 may not purchase wine and beer. What about whiskey? You have a text that provides for wine and beer, but it doesn't say about spirits that are, you know, 40 degrees plus of alcohol. Well, the reason is even stronger in the case of whiskey, guys. So you can safely do your analogy and say a false theory, you know, the reason is even stronger, okay? Another one is called a contrario sensu. Uh, it means on the contrary, you're sort of turning the proposal around to make sense of it. Uh, to look just like you would turn a glove, a sock or your t-shirt before putting it in the washer, okay? Uh, the argument assumes that what is not forbidden is allowed. So if you have a provision that is putting a ban or prohibition, you may say that everything that is not prohibited is allowed, okay? Example, Louisiana Civil Code Article 7, uh, you find the equivalent in the French Civil Code, by the way, persons may not, it's a prohibition, by their juridical act, which is a sort of generic term that includes contract or contractual arrangements, but any uh, statement of the will to produce some legal effect, so persons may not, by their juridical act, derogate from laws enacted for the protection of the public interest. Derogate means opt out or exclude the application of those laws, those laws that we have described last week as being imperative, okay? So any act in derogation of such law is an absolute nullity. The act cannot be regarded as valid. Oh, that's a forceful ban. Of course, you've got to figure out what public interest means, which is a problem of interpretation, right? Where you have to exert your exegetical, exegetical skills. But you can turn the proposal around, okay? Of course, you know that you may not bypass or opt out a provision that deals with the public interest. But if it does not deal with the public interest, can you do it or not? You may say that a contrario, any act that does not derogate such laws is permissible. Actually, the general rule, the principle is freedom of contract. If it's not, if no ban, it's allowed, okay? So it's a good way, if you will, to visit what is on the other side of the provision. You just turn it around and it looks like a prohibition, but it has actually a limited scope. In all the other cases, you are free, provided that you stay in compliance with other laws, of course. Oh my, they are other logical arguments. Uh, and all these need to be visited, but I know it is too much, right? Uh, your poor brains are challenged with that much logic, and I will meet you in part two to discuss the other rules. See you later.